Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IABC Heritage Region webinar, Breaking Through the Wall, Communicating to a Challenging Audience. My name is Greg McCormick, and I'm Communication Chair for the IABC Heritage Region. Our presenter today, Connie Fike, is a past winner of the IABC Heritage Region Silver Quill Award for her successful communication programs. She is currently Senior Manager, Marketing and Communications for IMED Vision Care, and also Vice President of Communications for the Greater Cincinnati Chapter of IABC. We're thrilled to have her with us today. Connie manages the provider communication strategy for IMED Vision Care, a vision benefits company that is part of the global company Luxottica. She spends her days writing and editing content, creating editorial calendars, overseeing contributor content, and working with agencies and cross-functional peers on design, development, and approvals of communications campaigns and messages. Throughout her nearly two-decade career at IMED, she's created targeted messaging for all of IMED's constituents, most recently eye doctors from around the country. How can you motivate action when your audience is unreceptive? Today, Connie will share real-life experiences and practical tips for meeting business goals by reaching and motivating audiences who are ambivalent or even downright belligerent. Before we begin, we do have a couple housekeeping notes. Amy Miller, an IABC Heritage Region Board member and our tech associate for this webinar. Amy will review a few quick points to help you gain the most from this experience. Amy? Thank you, Greg. Everyone, if you would like to watch today's webinar in full screen mode, then mouse to the top right portion of your screen and you'll see four small arrows. Click on that symbol to toggle in and out of full screen mode. During the presentation, if you'd like to send us a comment or question for discussion, please use the chat button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Just mouse down to the bottom of your screen and your toolbar will appear including the chat button. If any of you have joined with others watching in the same room using a single connection, that's great. If that's your situation, we ask that you kindly let us know how many are at your location using the chat tool records. Connie will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to join the conversation via chat later, right now we're showing some thoughts that may spur ideas for you. Also, today's webinar is being recorded. As a registered attendee, you will receive the following. A link to our very brief survey as you leave the webinar. Please take a moment to respond so we can keep making improvements. And you'll also get an email with links to the recording of today's webinar, the slides, and registration links for the next IABC Heritage Region webinar. And now back to Greg. Thank you, Amy. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Connie, take it away. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, today. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be able to show some um, tips and tricks that will hopefully be useful for all of you um, in your communications. So I'm sure as communicators, we've all felt like we, that our messages are just hitting a brick wall, going into oblivion. And I would say that even though we've all been there, some of us probably feel it a little, little more than others because we have some particularly challenging audiences. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today because those of us, I mean, all of us as communicators have messages that we need to get out there and goals that we need to achieve. But when you're dealing with a particularly challenging audience, it's even more critical that um, we take things to a, a different level to try to break through um, these walls that the audience puts up in front of us. So first, before we get uh, into the tips, a little bit about my audience. Um, the first thing I would say, actually, before I get into the characteristics, uh, let me tell you who they are. So I communicate to about 28,000 optometrists and opticians from around the country. Um, there are uh, very, various levels of tenure, meaning some of them have been practicing for decades and others are right out of optometry school. Uh, we do know that there's about a 50-50 gender mix. Um, we've seen a lot more females going into optometry school, so we do see that shifting to a higher percentage of females. And we also know that when we're communicating to this group, 
uh, we're actually talking to a lot of different people, not just the doctors who run the practices, but also their office staff. And many of these staff have different needs, priorities, education levels. And so all of this combined to right out of the gate be a very uh, diverse and unique audience that has a lot of factors to consider. But then if we look at the characteristics in terms of how they respond to communications, that's where we discover just how challenging they are. So I'm gonna share some generalizations. I do wanna point out that not all of our audience feels this way. I don't wanna seem like um, all optometrists are uh, difficult to talk to or anything like that, but these are definitely um, some characteristics that I glean um, having worked with them for a long time. Um, the, the big thing is with them is that they, most of them work with us begrudgingly. Um, and so when we ask, uh, providers to participate with us, we um, make them agree to accept certain rates, uh, which usually means they're taking a discount. And so right out of the gate, they're, they're not always excited about working with us, and it's definitely a love-hate relationship. And that creates a level of ambivalence. Um, even though some of them realize the value that we bring, they still see us as kind of not being the, the favorite part of, of their job. They're also very busy, and I'm sure a lot of you experience that with your audiences. Um, just like everybody else, um, we're competing for attention among a lot of different um, audiences. We have other carriers that are trying to reach out to them. But the other thing is, is that their goal in their, in their business is to see patients and take care of patients. And so communications from us can really seem like an interruption to them. Um, and something that gets in the way of them doing the thing that they do best, which is, to, again, take care of, of their patient's vision. Connie? Yes. Um, we just wanted to make sure, were you intending to share your slides just yet? Oh, I apologize. I thought I was. You might have started to share before I stopped sharing, so that might be my fault. Uh, no, that's okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, my apologies. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, a lot of these folks um, come out of the gate not really um, caring for my company in general. So not just the fact that we as a business have the goal of um, asking them to kind of to take discounts, but we are also part of a global leader in the industry. So we're very well known and people have mixed feelings about us and our role in the, in the uh, vision industry. They're also highly educated science-based uh, people, and so they're, they're definitely experts in vision care, and they want to be treated as such. So they're um, definitely a little bit, um, um, so they don't really care to be talked down to. So we have to be very careful about that. So these are all the things that um, I'm facing when it comes to, to them. Um, they're also um, slow to adapt to change. They, um, a lot of them have been in practice, as I said, for a long time, and some offices are in rural areas. They don't have good internet. Um, they don't want to become digital. They're still doing things on paper. And so these are all things that um, play into how we interact with them on, on the audience side. But then just like all of us, uh, we have some internal factors that also um, create some challenges in communicating with this audience. Like most companies, we have an audience hierarchy. Um, and so when we're looking at resources and initiatives, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we also have to, <clears throat> pardon me, we also have to look at the other audiences that we are working with. And those other audiences are often revenue generators. So you can imagine that when it comes time to prioritize, sometimes my audience ends up at the bottom of the hierarchy, which leads to potentially fewer resources. In addition, the, the company, as they make decisions, sometimes you know, they, they make decisions on processes or certain things that um, are not always the best for my audience. It's not that they're deliberately um, making decisions that are, that are bad for the audience, they're just not always the easiest for the audience to have to adapt to. So all of these things um, create the foundation that I'm working with and um, that, this is really um, where I've learned the most about um, communicating with a challenging audience. 
Um, when I took over this role about 10 years ago, these were all the things I had to kind of learn. And then the tips I'm going to share are the things that I found that have worked the best uh, when dealing with, with um, an audience that has this mixture of diversity and coming in with some feelings and then also balancing the income and the image. So my first tip probably sounds pretty basic for communicators out there, know your audience. But when you're dealing with a challenging audience, you have to go a little bit further than that. You also need to know your limits. And what I mean by that is that you need to know what, um, how, what your reasonable expectations are. When I first started in, in um, talking to this audience, I thought, oh, I can convince them all to just fall in love with us and do everything I ask. And I had to learn that that's not going to happen. So my goal is not 100% satisfaction or even 100% engagement. And I can't always change the overall perception of my company, although I would certainly like to. Um, but it, but I have to be able to focus, though, on what my actual goals are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I have to also understand that there's that not everybody is always going to to love us or love what I have to say and really almost take a clinical approach in, in to separating those feelings from achieving the goals that I need to. And once you have that knowledge of, of knowing your audience and knowing your limits, you can then start to use empathy to your advantage. So I love my company and I stand by everything we do, but as I said, sometimes the decisions that we make or the things I have to communicate are not um, going to be well received by my audience. And so what I, the first thing I have to do is step back and look at it from my audience's point of view and admit and recognize when the message may be a challenge to start with. And what I found is that when you start communications from where your audience is, you can frame the message more effectively. So here, here's an example. Um, we sometimes have to create work around processes, usually related to systems or things like that. And some of those processes can be time consuming for providers. So before I put one word on the page, I think about what the message is gonna mean to them, what's it gonna mean to the people in their office, and what other factors might they be dealing with at the moment. And some examples of that would be, um, I know that in December, our provider offices are very busy with lots of people coming in to use their vision benefits. So if I have to communicate a workaround in December, I know it's gonna even be harder for them than if I was to have to share that information another time of the year. And so then when I sit down to craft the message, I can do it in a way that they'll relate to and I'm not doing it in, um, in a uh, kind of a narrow viewpoint of just thinking about just the process, but understanding all of those other factors that are happening around them. Some of the tactics I've used um, when actually writing the communication is to also explain the reasoning behind things. Um, a number of our requirements are actually related to either government regulations or uh, client requirements. Um, and so I don't hesitate to explain that, not as a way of making an excuse or pitching blame to anybody else, but as a way of kind of creating this we're all in this together type thing, especially when it comes to the healthcare regulations. We say, you know, we're all kind of, we're all dealing with this, but let's let's work through it and let's let's get done what we need to do in order to comply. Um, another thing that we've been doing a lot of recently um, is starting off with "We heard you" or "We know it's a busy time of year," and again, it helps start out of the gate by making the message about them, not about us. And that can be really hard, I know, in a corporate communications environment because we do want to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the right light and we do want to push our key messages out. Um, but we are, need to make sure that we're always putting them first um, because that's going to help build that rapport, rapport excuse me, um, right out of the gate and hopefully make them more receptive even when the message is something that they're not totally excited to hear about. Um, I do also try to, hard to not make it about my company or how it helps us because, frankly, at the end of the day, they don't care whether it helps my company or not. Um, this particular audience just wants to know what's, what's it 
going to do for them? What's the, the outcome for them? And um, they really don't want to know if it benefits us or not. So I have learned to cut all of that stuff out. Um, when I compare my approach to how we communicate with other audiences in our company, um, the main difference is that I do have to strip out some of the traditional marketing language. Um, I still have a message hierarchy and platform that I use, but a lot of that is about dealing with the potential objections that I'm going to get. And so I still run all of my communications up against our message hierarchy and uh, pillars for, for this audience, but those pillars are not about selling something, they're not about um, you know, getting a certain benefit or feature out there about how do we make sure that we're turning it around in a way that they can relate to. So that naturally leads to the next tip, which is to do your best to position things positively, but always be honest. Um, I'm often, again, tasked with communicating messages that can be viewed unfavorably by the end audience. And the business will want me to say, hey, try to make this positive. Try to make sure it doesn't sound like a bad thing. And you have to balance that, though. Here's what I recommend. If the message is unfavorable, start with the facts and stick to the facts. Don't sugarcoat things. Don't oversell it. And don't pretend that it's good news if it's not. For instance, if you um, have a system and uh, update coming out and it's not enhancement, don't call it an enhancement. They will see right through you and they'll call you out on it. So what I do instead is acknowledge the change, explain as much as I can about the reasoning, the background, and how it's going to affect them, but I don't call it a good thing unless it really is. On the flip side, when it is good news, take credit and position it as such. You got to celebrate the small victories and the little wins. Good news is definitely more genuine and believable when you're not ca calling everything you do good news, especially with an audience who is a be potentially belligerent. The last thing you want to do is call everything good because they're going to call you out on it. But when you do reserve that term of good news for truly positive things, they're much more uh, responsive to that. And an example I have is um, a campaign that actually just hit the market last week. Um, so we've been receiving um, complaints from um, the providers about a particular aspect of our businesses, business, excuse me, which is um, the payment statements that we provide. So um, we have finally completely overhauled the document to specifically address issues that they've brought up. This is good news. I don't need to sugarcoat it or, or upsell it. It's great news. But instead of just saying, hey, look what we did, we're actually leading with the message of you've opened our eyes. So we're giving them credit out of the gate. And because we haven't tried to make everything we do sound like the best thing since sliced bread, I'm really hopeful that this will be received with less skepticism than can accompany some of the uh, reactions uh, to, Im to improvements that we've made. I really believe that you earn trust by not um, exaggerating or overselling things that you do as a company. So the next tip is know what you can and cannot control, and then find ways to overcome what you can. So I think this one can be a real challenge for people um, in communications in general. I'm not always in control of the decisions that are made um, or the, the messages that I have to send. A lot of times it gets kind of dumped in my lap and I know that happens to a lot of us. But uh, what I have done is tried to figure out how I can uh, change the way that we communicate to at least address some of the challenges that they're experiencing. So, so as I mentioned, they're very busy. There's lots of conflicting channels, things like that. Those are things that are in my control and things that I can um, address. And so what we've done is we've created personalized newsletters so that the audience can actually go in and they can choose um, not just the frequency and the cadence, but they can also choose um, what stories and topics are most important to them, and then the system will actually display those first. 
Um, and if they don't take the time to go in and tell us these things, the system will actually learn their behaviors and adapt it that way so that when they're receiving messages, they're receiving the type of content um, that they want at the top of the newsletter. And this has really helped create um, better engagement and they pay more attention because they're not, you're not just forcing some story down their throat that they really don't care about. Um, this, we also, along with this, we do content filtering. We make sure that they're not having to sift through anything that doesn't pertain to them. So there's certain aspects of our business that only apply to a subset and everything, um, all of our channels are segmented in a way that they are only viewing what pertains to them. And, and that has also really helped to show that we're trying to maximize their, their time and reduce the amount of time they have to spend uh, reading the communications and also sorting through the content. Um, we do try to get as much feedback as we can. Um, I mentioned that the campaign uh, that we're launching was based on their feedback and that was a true statement. We do, we have reached out and we collect their, the information and we try to do as much as we can with it. Um, sometimes, you know, you collect feedback and it kind of kind of doesn't go anywhere. It is important to try to make sure that, that they see the results of that feedback um, and we've worked really hard to do that. Another thing that, um, or another principle that we really apply to all of our communications is to keep it very simple and straightforward and easily scannable. Again, this is to that point that they're very busy. Um, it's also to the point that we're reaching, trying to reach multiple audiences, some of which are sort of frontline staff that may not be as highly educated. So we don't want to go out with a bunch of clinical words because we're not just talking to doctors, we're also talking to people who are greeting patients in the office or who are filing claims. And so we keep things as kind of broken, chunked up as possible so that it's easy for them to get to the information they need quickly. Um, the good thing is our business, our brand voice um, is very um, helpful in that because we have a very conversational voice. Um, we use very casual language, so I do recognize that can be harder depending on your brand and also your industry, but we have found that it, the, the uh, most that you can boil it down, the better for the end user, especially when they're in this kind of a position where they're not coming to you to read, you're going to them and telling them they need to read. We also um, have an online portal where we keep everything and it's all searchable, um, as you can see up in the, the top corner. And again, that makes it um, easy for them to get to what they want quickly, not have to sift through. Um, there's also a lot of self-service tools available on this site um, with the goal of them being able to come to us when they need to um, and not have to spend a lot of time um, digging around. Um, we've also had to, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, uh, we've had to look at different channels um, and even down to doing faxes. Um, and every time I tell people that, they look at me kind of strangely. Um, but when I started in this position, everything was in paper um, or on fax. And I've tried my best to get rid of it, but I also know that, that there are some people who just don't have good adoption of, of digital platforms. And so in that case, there is a small number um, of providers that I have to communicate to via fax for certain things. And, you know, as much as it complicates my job a little bit, I realize that it's important to meet them uh, where they're at and to provide it in a channel that works the best for them. Um, another consideration when you're looking at what you can and cannot control is to really take a close look at all of the visual and non-visual communications. Um, and so uh, I'd love to tell the story about how I once used a, a photo similar to this one here with the, the redhead um, on a newsletter where she had her glasses pulled down and I didn't think anything of it. But I got two emails that same day from providers who were just furious because they said, you know, we sell eyeglasses to help people see better but they only work if they actually cover the eyes. And you know, they were right. And I thought, well, how silly of me that I was so focused on, you know, finding a cute picture that I didn't think about it from their point of view. 
So I thanked them for the feedback and I swapped the photo out. And I can tell you that from now, from that point forward, I never um, used any photos that had anybody with no fitting glasses. Um, and the same goes for glasses on animals. I think this is a really cute picture. Doctor, eye doctors, not so much. Uh, they don't want to see corrective vision, uh, corrective eyewear, excuse me, on animals because that's not what they're meant for. And it is part of their livelihood, so it makes total sense. Um, so we, I've even had to go so far as to um, have a photo shoot um, demonstrating different clinical um, positions because the stock photos, the models are usually using the equipment incorrectly. So what I've discovered is that when you have an audience that doesn't exactly love you, they will not hesitate to tell you if something is wrong, not just with the words, but with the pictures. And so I have to take a lot of care in every aspect of, of our communication strategy. Um, but again, those are things that I can control. And so those are things that I, I can address up front and um, also serve as a reviewer for other people to make sure that they're abiding by those standards as well. And then to take that to the next level is to use your experience to help influence process improvements. So I think this is something that I think all communicators can strive to do, and it's definitely easier in some organizations than it is in others. Um, and I do definitely recognize that. But what I have found is that if you can tell the right story over time, people will start to come to you um, and, and get your, your thoughts and opinions up front and um, from the standpoint of how is this gonna affect your audience? And it, it took me a very, very long time to get to that point. Um, the strategy that I found was to really make sure you're tying it back to financial um, uh, KPIs and ROI. Um, that can be tough for communicators, especially with me, as I said, I'm not, uh, my audience doesn't generate revenue. So one thing I found though was that I could tie what I do back to um, call center savings. So um, we have a call center that supports both our members and our providers. And if I could demonstrate that what I had communicated or the way I had communicated it helped reduce calls into the call center, then I had ROI right there. Um, the thing is, is it takes a lot longer to explain um, to, to the business. So I really had to get my data together and I kind of had to walk them through from start to finish. Um, and I had to take the time to do that. Because if the organization thinks that it's not worth investing at all in um, communicating to a challenging audience, which I faced that before, where they're like, well, they're never going to like us, so why bother? Then it's up to us as the communicators to demonstrate to them why it matters. And of course, when dealing with, with leadership, it's probably going to be the bottom line that matters. Um, I have had to, because we are a sales-driven uh, company, I've had to make sure that leadership understands the downstream effect of poor communication with my audience. Um, in my case, if the provider is upset, they could very easily talk to a member or to a client and complain to them or create a bad experience for the member and client. Those two audiences are our revenue generators. But I had to make that connection um, for some folks who didn't quite see it or didn't understand why we would worry about talking to a group of people who were never going to love us. And then, of course, um, even when leaders listen to you and come to you and, and say, hey, how is this going to affect your audience? And you tell them the decision may still end up being um, something that's not altogether favorable for your audience. And, and that's OK. You know, the answer can be no from the organization, but over time, you might be really surprised at how much influence your perspective can have. Um, and then it helps all of us as communicators, I think, when we have that opportunity to have a seat at the table and to help shape the plot of the story rather than, than just telling the story. Um, but again, this is one that definitely takes time. Um, and I think it's even harder when you have, again, an audience that's kind of lower on that, that audience hierarchy. But the good news is, is that there are things to celebrate. Um, and so the other thing that I try to focus on is setting goals and celebrating 
little victories. And for me, that means celebrating progress, not perfection. As I said out of the gate, I'm not trying to get 100% of anything. Um, but what I can do is I can look at where we started at, I can look at benchmarks, and I can set measurable goals based on that. And it has to be, though, put in a way that makes sense for the business. For instance, I focus a lot on engagement, um, but I also make sure to provide ind industry comparisons. So it's easy for folks who aren't in communications to look at an open rate or a click-through rate and not understand um, if not understand that it's a good thing. They may say, well, 30% doesn't sound very high. You have to give the context around it. And that's been one of the, the biggest challenges that I've had just in general as a communicator is getting uh, people outside of our profession to see what is a good result. And so again, it has to be about crafting that story and making sure that I'm taking the time to celebrate the, those, those victories and then share that with leadership in a way that they can relate to. You know, there can be a tendency to downplay results that are less than ideal, but they can serve as a starting point and provide that foundation for improvement. Um, you know, nobody wants to talk about the fact that, you know, maybe our satisfaction rate among this group is low. But if I can say, yeah, the satisfaction is low, but we've improved it by 5%, then it's still a good story and it's still something to celebrate. Um, one of the um, things that um, I mentioned that the satisfaction, that is a true story in our case, where um, we, we do an annual survey of this audience and we ask them to rate our communications and they have consistently related us, excuse me, rated us below 30%. But that's not really the story that matters. Um, instead, I don't even talk to people about that satisfaction. Instead, I talk to them about the 2 million website page views that I get every year on our communications portal. The 31% newsletter open rate, because as I said, I also frame that to say, to tell people, by the way, the industry standard is 18. Um, I talk about our 50% email open rates, which are outstanding. And I once had a manager who um, looked at me, and at the time, I think we were around 35%, and he was like, that's just that's only a third of people and i was like well, yeah but that's great um i had to again share with him what what great looks like and now i can say not only is 50 percent great when compared with industry standard but it's also 15 percent higher than we had three years ago and then the same thing with the open the email open rates and so i make sure that i am creating the story of what success is and i'm telling that story um, back to the business in a way that they can relate to. Um, and this also keeps me going on those days when I go, wow, this is a hard group and wow, they've really, they're not, they're not happy with us. I can say, you know what, that's okay because I'm still achieving my business goals and I'm still doing what I need to do as a communicator. Which again leads into this last uh, tip to develop a thick skin. And I think this is probably a tip that all of us as communicators can benefit from. It's tough and it's even tougher when you have an audience who has no qualms of calling you out. I have received countless emails back from this group of people who have no, uh, no issue cussing at me, uh, telling me that they don't like us, telling me that they don't like our communications. And, you know, it's tough. It's, uh, we're all human and we don't like to be told that, but I, I really have had to step back and again, focus on those victories and say, you know what, it's not personal. And one thing that I've learned works really well is if you actually take the time to reply back. Um, most of the people who have responded to me, I'm pretty sure they thought they were sending a message to some um, no reply email. And so when I said to them, ah, thank you for your feedback. A lot of them came back and said, oh, sorry, didn't mean to cuss at you. Um, I think you did mean to cuss, but it's okay. Um, we, uh, we, do, we all do the best we can. And, and I think um, it's, it's just something that you have to, uh, to go into knowing that you're gonna get bad feedback um, from an, an audience like this. And, and it's not a reflection on you as a person or you as a communicator. 
And so at the end of the day, it's all about keeping the end in mind. You know, um, my job is not to create a fan club. Um, it's to make sure that my audience takes appropriate action based on the uh, communications that I'm sending out on behalf of my company. And even if at the end of the day, they still have a love-hate relationship with me, um, I can demonstrate to myself and to my business that what I'm doing is meaningful and that we're achieving goals that matter. Um, and then always looking for those opportunities to improve and, and continuing to do everything I can um, to be an advocate for my audience while still being an advocate for my company. And if you've been dealing with a particularly difficult audience, it is possible to, to break through the wall and to achieve your goals and to find success. Um, it just may take time and diligence and a little bit of, uh, of just being able to, to have a thick skin. So um, I thank you for your time. I know we're going to have some questions here in a second. Um, please feel free um, to hit me up on social media. Um, I do warn everybody that in addition to communications, I do tweet a lot about reality TV. So that is the risk you take if you follow me on Twitter. So uh, thank you very much, Greg. I'll turn it back over to you again. Thanks, Connie, for bringing those insights to us. And now we'd like to entertain some audience questions. Do it. Connie, also, if you're able to stop sharing, I can start. Oops, sorry. It's okay. Oops. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. So now you should see the things to think about slide we shared at the beginning of the program. Um, while we start some questions, uh, give those some thought. And if you have any questions, please use the chat tool to submit them. Uh, first question, Connie, is can you explain a little bit more about the newsletter personalization that you did? What did you have to do to fine tune that process? Oh, sure. So um, I, I don't want it to come off as a, as a uh, promotion for a company, but I actually do use a tool called Circle. Um, this tool um, um, allows me to basically put the data in and then um, it's actually connected by API to my communications um, portal and it pretty much does everything else. And I know that there's, um, I know that there are several companies like this. The one I use is called Circle, C-E-R-K-L. Um, and they're, um, I actually met them at an IABC um, conference. So I know that they're a big supporter of IABC as well, which is, which is nice. But um, as I said, it basically takes the content and then uses AI behind the scenes to do all of that personalization that I was talking about, where it actually monitors like what the people are clicking on and then personalizes the content back to them. Thanks. Okay, next question. What kind of tools, visuals, or reports have you used to explain strategy to business leaders? Um, so we, I have a couple of different um, approaches that I take. Um, one is I actually, have, I have a kind of a dotted line into our provider operations team and we have a monthly um, KPI session where I report out. Um, I, I don't have a sample available, but um, I basically show trends year over year for all of those key things that I showed you. So uh, website page views, open rates, newsletter open rates, click-throughs. Um, so I make sure to kind of overlay it though against the prior year um, because that helps to tell the story again of improvements so that people can see that even if something looks like a low number, doesn't mean that it's a bad number. Okay. Um, here's a quick question, just as a reminder. Um, may have missed this, but how many audience members do you communicate to and are they all in one location? I'm assuming they're almost all virtual. Yes, they're all virtual. So um, there's 28,000, give or take, across the country. Um, that does include Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, they are people who have, they're like subcontractors for us. They have contracts with us, but they're not employees of the company. Um, so they, have, they own their own businesses, um, and they just work with us as um, we are a vision care vendor benefits company. So they provide the network services. Um, the that members get when they use our benefits. Um, and, and interestingly, um, because we do have them all over the country, again, it kind of, when you look at demographics, creates a lot of different uh, needs and different challenges. Um, and then we also um, have a 
group of providers in Puerto Rico, as I mentioned, um, and over the last year, we had to start translating all of our communication. And it has helped a lot because, again, it's about meeting the audience where they are um, and not expecting them to, to come to us. And so um, we actually have a whole set of tools now available just for um, the group that's in Puerto Rico. Okay, what sources do you use to benchmark your data? Um, so I have used a couple different sources. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of the company. I think it's, it's one of the, um, the email um, companies out there. Like it might be Constant Contact or Exact Target, one of those two. Um, they have industry benchmarks um, for email open rates and click-through rates. Um, I've also worked with some of my vendors, so I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of agencies that I work with. Um, and a lot of times they have access to resources as well. Okay, then there's a question along the same lines regards to the geographic uh, structure. Do you communicate to, like tomorrow's message might be only to providers in Pennsylvania, for example. Do you do that kind of targeting or is it all an thing communication? Yes, I do. So um, the website that I shared um, in, um, is filtered by state as well as by some other factors, um, different contract arrangements that people have with us. Um, so yes, we do a lot of that. And again, our goal is I should never be bothering a, a person in California about something happening in Pennsylvania. Um, so, so the personalization allows you to parse it by geographic location as well? Correct, yes, the filtering. And that filtering does pass through to the newsletter as well, yeah. Okay, um, how about how you've, uh, do you, any uh, challenges with engaging managers in reaching these audiences? Do you uh, have that kind of structure as well, or is it strictly to providers? No, it, it, it is. Um, so for me, it's internal. Um, I work a, a lot across functions, and so I do have to get um, kind of buy-in from everybody, um, and that can be challenging. So um, I think if, if the questions regarding managers, like from an employee communication standpoint, um, I don't have that set up, but I do often have to go and get um, certain people kind of on my side before I roll it out to everybody else. And I think that's, that's a pretty common uh, scenario with communication. So my strategy there is just to kind of understand who are those key people and I go to them first, get their buy-in and then go to, you know, up the ladder, so to speak, um, and get um, the rest of the people on board with my have the key, the key players. Um, okay. Do you use side. case studies at all? Um, you know, I have not simply because there aren't a lot of case studies out there for this audience. Um, I've looked. Um, it's a very unique situation because they're not employees and they're not, uh, they're not clients. They're kind of in this weird gray area. Um, and in the healthcare space, I've tried and I have not been able to find any. So if anybody finds any, I would love to see them. And then there's just one, there's a, no other questions come in electronically. Here we go. Um, oh, uh, how many people on your team? Are you a one person show or is there a multiple groups? Um, so technically I'm a one person show. I do have, right now I have a contractor and I occasionally have an intern working with me. But yeah, I've had to, the challenge there is I've had to find resources like Circle and other things to help automate. Um, because otherwise I don't have the resources, you know, to do this personalization and things that I need to. So I rely heavily on vendors. Right. And then I guess the, uh, the, the last question I have right now is, um, have you tried to introduce any like new social media tools, things like that? I know you said some of these people are uh, just fax machine and hard copy people. <laughs> yeah. Tried and, and just shifted uh, the direction or is that probably to come? Well, it's something I've, I've considered. Um, this particular group, um, they're very big users of Facebook, um, but I have not yet, um, from our, from an outbound communication standpoint, um, set up that channel yet. Um, because they have been kind of slow adopters of different technology, it hasn't been a priority. Um, our focus had really been on getting digital um, and getting them to engage with email. So I spent probably two or three years when I first came into the role of, of getting, making that change happen. Um, and some of the strategies we used, I mean, first we had to collect the information. 
um, which is you know step one and not always easy. But then we had to really kind of get um, I don't want to say mean, but we had to kind of draw a line in the sand and say certain things are only going to be available digitally, um, and that kind of that did definitely help. Um, but I still have, I mean, there's still a pretty large audience that I have who does not engage with us on our digital platforms. Um, and those continue to be like every year, that's my goal is get that number up and find new ways to reach them. Um, and I, I, I am convinced there are some people though that again, understanding the limits um, of what I do, there are some people I'm never going to get to pay me um, and you just got, I gotta move on. I can't spend all my time doing that. Um, but with social media, it's definitely something I would love to look into. We're just not quite there yet. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue right now. If anyone has one they want to uh, submit or uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we can uh, answer you right now or I go ahead and wrap things up. Greg, were there a couple of advanced questions that we haven't gotten to yet? Uh, that, was, that was the advanced questions I read through. Okay. I did see um, one comment from someone, she just sent it to all the panelists. I thought this was interesting that Linda shared. She said, I used to leave classes that home buyers were legally required to attend if they were borrowing their down payment from a state program. I would tell them, I bet you probably wish you were anywhere but here tonight, but I can tell you that 95% of survey respondents who sat through this class in previous months said they were better prepared for home ownership as a result. So stick with me and I hope you'll find it beneficial just as they did. I acknowledge the emotion in the room and usually that usually calm things down. So, and that's certainly a, a nice empathetic strategy. Yeah. And your messaging, Connie, that you, this is my question, um, try, to, try to get in their place in the first paragraph, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a very common thing that I do is, um, make sure that that yeah that that opening is not fluffy from the sense of let me tell you something exciting but to say either hey we recognize where you're at um or to just sometimes even just get right into it if it's something that doesn't require that kind of that level of empathy um, but i love that strategy of saying um, of using the data to tell the story and we have used that a lot too um and i think that's a great way to, to you know, out of the gate, you know, recognize that, yeah, they'd rather be anywhere else, but then say, but you might change your mind by the time you're done. Do you have um, provider surveys with results you're able to share in a context similar to what Linda was talking about? Um, I can't share the data because it's proprietary, but we do a number of surveys. Um, I mentioned the annual satisfaction survey that we do. Um, that one, as I said, is not as valuable to me because it doesn't tells us the story. Just to ask a provider if they're satisfied with communications doesn't really tell me what I need to know. Um, so I do usually certain uh, programs that I'll launch. I will do individual surveys for those um, and gauge how they felt about that program. And then it's a lot easier to then measure the success of an individual program that way. Um, we also do a lot of pilots. Um, so we'll go out and say, okay, we're going to take um, you know, a group of 15 or 20, test it with them, and then we do the survey with that pilot group. So then we have the data and the statistics to use um, in our storytelling. Thanks, very good. All right, thanks, Amy, for catching the other question as well. And thank everyone for your questions today. Um, Connie, I don't think there's anything else right now, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up uh, the conversation. If you have any further questions, you can certainly contact Connie on her social media channels. And again, be ready to talk about reality TV. <laughs> uh, I want to remind people too that the IABC Heritage Region has a webinar coming up next month, November 13th, for Global Technology Trends. Working to stay ahead of change and keep organizational communications relevant can best happen when we understand and embrace the technical side of the business. Tracy M, ABC, APR, and a communications expert and leadership coach will talk about trending technologies and how they'll impact our business communication activities. And finally, we wanna make sure you're aware of a few other things as we part company. Please complete the participant survey. It will open when you exit. If you have questions about the webinar or the IABC Heritage Region, or you'd like to get more involved, 
email communication at iabcheritage.com. And to learn more about ABC membership benefits, go to iabc.com slash membership. Thanks again for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.